Okay. So we were trying to look at uh, who directors are. Sorry for that break in transmission. And we are trying to establish that directors are primarily agents of the company and not agents of the employees of the company. They are not agents of the employees, neither are they agents of the members of the company. So they represent the company directly and not its shareholders or its other stakeholders. And so when we come to duties of directors, you will see that their primary duty is to pursue and ensure that they advance the purposes and interests of the company. Can we proceed? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, requirement for directorship. You will see from section 271, originally every company was, in, was mandated or required to have two directors, but what section 271 of CAMA 2020 is now providing is that except for small companies, every company is required to have two directors. But it doesn't provide that every company must have a director. So that got me thinking. Is it that small companies no longer need directors? It's something I want you to think about. I think what they intended was that every company must have a director, but small companies can have one director. You know, but it wasn't couched properly. So what you see there is that every company other than a small company must have two directors. I think what they should have written or started is that every, every company must have a director first, at least a director. And then before providing that, every company other than a small company. So the presumption, however, is that every company ought to have a director, but for small companies, they mustn't have two directors. In the past, under section and 247 of Kama 1990, if a company carries on business with less than one director after a specified time frame, or every member of the company and every director that was aware of that fact will be liable for the death of the company. That same obligation is reproduced under uh, the section. The only difference, under section 271, the only difference now is that it only applies to public companies. So let's talk about types of directors. Types of directors and shadow directors. So we have shadow directors, alternate directors, nominee directors, de facto directors, yeah, de jure directors, exec non-executive directors, and executive directors. I'll just run through them. I want to believe you've listened to the audio so you know about them. A shadow director is a director whose name is not necessarily inserted in the company's register of directors. Yeah, it doesn't, he mustn't have been duly appointed as a director, so it's not somebody who shows his hand as a director. Rather, the directors of the company are accustomed to operate or to act in accordance with his instructions. So please note that. Note also that a, a professional, a professional like a lawyer or an auditor or an accountant who gives instructions to the company and the company obliges, I mean, complies with his directive, is not for that purpose said to be a director of the company. Are you with me so far? Yes, so an alternate director is somebody who alternates. He alternates. We don't have that provision actually in camera, but it's still important that you know it. So it could represent a director who is going on leave for, for, a, for a number of years or a number of months. When that director comes, he steps down. So that is an alternate director. Who is a nominee director? A nominee director is a director who sits on the board but he is primarily there to represent the interests of a particular shareholder. He is a nominee director nominated to sit on the board to, to, to advance and to protect and to represent the interests of a particular shareholder. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yes, so an example is LNG. LNG has about, they have a board of directors. And on this board, we have different directors representing different interests. So we have directors from NNPC, directors from Shell, directors from uh, Total, and uh, directors from Agip. Each of these directors are sitting on the board definitely to advance the interests of the company, but also to cater for the particular and peculiar interests 
of the person nominating them, then a de facto director is a person who sits on the board of directors, but he hasn't necessarily been duly appointed. So he hasn't been duly appointed. There's probably no record of him ever being appointed, but either he's holding himself out as a director and the company is also holding him out as being duly appointed. Such a person is a director in the eyes of the law. And of course, if, the, if a third party, third party transacts with, with the company through him, the company will be bound because he is a de facto director. The jury directors are directors who have been duly appointed. Non-executive directors are directors who sit on the board, but they do not have any contract of service. They do not have any contract of service. So they are not employees of the company. They just have one capacity upon which, with which they relate with the company. So they are just directors. But an executive director, on the other hand, is a person who sits on the board and is at the same time an employee of the company. So he operates in dual capacities. On the one hand, he has a contract of employment. On the other hand, he's a member of the board of directors. He sits on the board. Can we continue? Yeah. So please look at section 270. Mm. So first and subsequent directors, so since 272, 273, usually the first directors will be inserted in the memorandum and in the articles of association. Thereafter, subsequent directors can be appointed. Are you with me? Yes. yes, then we could also have what we call casual vacancies. We could also have what we call casual vacancies. From time to time, a director may resign, uh, may be sacked, may die. Anything could happen. Are you with me so far? Yes. Where, where such occurs, the board of directors have the authority and the power to fill that position. Do Mbana, thank you. The board of directors have the power and the authority to fill that space. So that is what they call a casual vacancy. You see that under section 274. And when they do so, at the next annual general meeting, they will require the uh, rest of the shareholders to ratify, to ratify the appointment of the uh, directors. Again, in the very, very unlikely event that all the directors of the company die, in the very unlikely event that all the directors of the company die, the personal, personal representatives of the, uh, yeah, all the directors and all the shareholders die, then the personal representatives are mandated to call a meeting and at that meeting appoint uh, yeah, directors. And if they fail to do that, the creditors of the company. Annabelle, are you with us? Very good. Excuse me, sir. Yes, please. Now, you were more explicit about uh, shadow directors mm -hmm. in the... In the recording. The recording. Yes, yes. But uh, still like that, uh, the, uh, the act yes. says directors must be appointed. Yes. No, it doesn't say must be appointed. Ought to, they ought to be duly appointed. Okay. They ought to, that is the right thing to, to do. But the act also recognizes the fact that a director may not have been duly appointed, but if he's held out by the company, if he's held out by the company, then uh, the company will be bound by his actions. But, but the company will also have breached the provisions of karma. So yes, in a sense, you are right. Directors must be duly appointed because if you don't duly appoint a director, you are breaching karma mm -hmm. and you'll be liable to pay a fine. And that director also who has not been duly appointed and presumes to act will also have committed an offense and will have to pay a fine. But that notwithstanding, it doesn't affect the validity of any act of such a, a, a director not duly appointed with respect to a third party, particularly an innocent third party who is not aware of the fact that he was not duly appointed. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. You remember again that there's a presumption of regularity. Presumption of regularity. We talked about it in first semester. The old karma was section 69, but in the new karma, you find out between section 89 and 93. So presumption of regularity. Any person dealing with the company is presumed or is entitled to presume that any, any person duly held out by the company has been so duly appointed. Yes, okay, quickly. Sir, no, sir, uh, I'm not done yet. Uh -huh. Just before okay comes in. Now, the shadow director, 
yes. operates from the background. Yes. Who appoints him? That Nobody sure. appoints him. Nobody appoints no, him. No, no, no. So yes, why director should he? Yes, sir. Just be, like a godfather, like you said. Yes, he could be a controlling, controlling shareholder of the company. For example, you have over fifty percent of the shares of the company. You are in law deemed to be a controlling shareholder. You have appointed directors. Ideally, you should allow them to work. But if you do not allow them to work, and you are now playing the role of the piper, controlling what they are doing from the shadows, you know, in, in telling them what they must do, to an extent whereby they have lost their independence, then you are a shadow director. Yes, sir. And so the provisions of karma will apply to you. Yes, quickly. So I, I want to give an example with Zenith Bank. Okay. I said so some time ago. Yes. Jimovia was the yes. managing director. Yes. Okay. Now, it's Kama German. said, hold on, you have uh, outstayed your usefulness. He's in VI. His office is on top of <laughs> that of the managing director. He's not the managing director, but he still detects of course. whatever is happening there. Mm. So, he's chairman. Mm. But he's the shadow MD. But he's the shadow MD. The ah. MD there cannot do anything without referring to Jim Ovia in the It happens. Yes. So, can we call such a person? In his own case, he's already a director. As a chairman, he's a director. Okay. If he, was, if he wasn't on the board and he was doing that, then you could call him a shadow director. But since he's already a director, you could call him a shadow MD. Are you with me? Yes. Because as a chairman, he's already a director. Okay. Mm. Yes. Recognized? No, not necessarily. But you can. Um, no, okay, land now. Okay. Because if you were, we know that um, disqualification of directors, when you are asked for disqualification, most of the shadow directors are directors who are being disqualified. Just because they probably want to have control of their companies and all the rest, they try to have them in shadow. So, in one of the record videos, you also made this statement that shadow directors are. I, I couldn't have said that, that they are recognized by law. You, must, you have to say the way I said it. Can we continue, please? Yeah, so if you look at section 270, let's look at 270. Sir, excuse me, sir. Yes, please. Let's not. Shadow directors yes. are operating from the background. Yes. And they cannot uh, come out openly to say they are directors. How are they known? If, I'm saying this, because you also said that they are still liable. If the company goes into insolvency, yes. they will still be held liable to pay. No, not that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Please look at look at section 270 and note note 270, 269, 269, 276. And 280. Okay, let somebody read, read 270, please. The first and, and subsection, quickly. Subsection 1, yes. Without prejudice to the provisions of sections 269 and 276 of this prejudice. Act. Without prejudice. Please go on. <laughs> and for the purposes of sections 279, 301 and 307 of this act. Yes. Director shall include any person on whose instructions and direction the director are accustomed to act. Excellent. So for the purposes of those particular, just for the purpose of those particular sections that we now also include shadow directors. Other than that, shadow directors are not recognized. So they're only recognized for. So I couldn't have said Shadow directors are recognized by law. But for certain purposes, like for disqualification, if a company has been run aground, directors have been found to have been involved in fraud, and we want to disqualify director A, B, and C, and we can adduce evidence to show that Mr. Z was also controlling these three directors. The court can also proceed to that to disqualify Mr. Z from being involved in directing the company for the next 10 years. So it is only with respect to 
specific instances that uh, shadow directors can be yeah, recognized. Please, let's move on. So I've talked about casual vacancy. And yes, so let, let me talk briefly about director's share qualification. Director's share qualification. Again, it's not, it's not important or it's not relevant that the director must be a shareholder of a company. The director mustn't be a member of a company. But where the articles of the company require directors to hold shares in the company, Kama provides that directors should do so within a particular time frame, two months to be precise, and if they fail to do that, they will have to vacate office. And that man, yes, why would the company want to require directors to hold shares? Why will directors be required to hold shares? Yes, you have listened to my audio. Can somebody put it in a better way? Yes, there it is. So I think that, um, for example, if I'm working for a company and I don't start to lose anything for that company, I might make decisions that, anyhow, let it just happen. But if I have interest in that company, I'll make decisions that it will be good for the company because it will benefit me too. Okay, you could say that. But as an employee, particularly if you're a director that is an employee, if the company goes down, you, you may also lose your job. But a company may want to require directors to have shares, basically, just like she said, to uh, align the interests of the shareholder to those of the, the interests of the director to those of the shareholders. So they're what they call goal congruence in corporate governance, goal congruence, ensuring that there's, there's, there's congruence, there's unity in objective and all that. So for that purpose, the company may want to see what commitment do you even have in this company? And so they may require all the directors to vote. So please look at section 277 of Kama. Also, for public companies, I just want to point out that the public company, every director who is above 70, that fact must be disclosed. The person proposing a director or a person to be appointed as a director of a public company who is above 70 must disclose that fact. Also, if you are being proposed as a director, and you are both 70, you must also disclose that fact. And failure to do that again is an offense. Let's talk briefly about qualification of directors. Qualification of directors. Again, it's crucial to note that there is no specific qualification in terms of expertise or skill that is required for directors of companies. For the secretary of the company, there is a specific requirement, public companies that the secretary must be, must be an educated person, must either be a lawyer, uh, an accountant, or a chartered secretary. But when we come over to directors, anybody can be a director of a company. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. Except a specific statute requires that the directors operating in this particular industry, for example, like the banking sector, in the Banking Act, requires that directors of banks must have this particular level of expertise, then they will have to have that. But other than that, as far as Kama is concerned, at the basic level, anybody can be a director of, the, of a company. So there is no requirement with respect to qualification other than the fact that uh, above 70, you must disclose. But when we come to duties, you will find out that even if you do not have expertise and skill, you will still be required to rise up to the occasion to meet the particular demands of that particular company that you have uh, undertaken to direct. And if you fail to do that, you may be held liable for breaching your duty of care and, uh, and uh, skill. OK. Yes, so before I, I jump that, who appoints directors? Who appoints directors? Mr. Uh, Bekowi. 
who appoints the rector? So, members in general is not even on the record, directors. Hmm? Um, directors can appoint um, alternates or candidates to directors. Um, Very good. It is, it's, it's easy to just assume that and directors are appointed by members, which is which is the default um, default position. But just like he pointed out, even the board of directors, they can fill a, a, a casual vacancy. And the articles of association or any contractual provision can mandate any other person, even if that person is not a shareholder of the company, to appoint a director. It's always important that you note that. So for example, a creditor may be able to appoint directors of the company. So it's not always the members in general meeting. I talked about different classes of shareholders. We talked about that, didn't we? Yes. And we said that class A shares may have rights that differ from those of class B shares. And one of such rights could be that class A shareholders may have the right to appoint the chief financial secretary chief financial officer of the company, why class B shareholders may have the right to appoint the managing director. So in practice, directors do not have to be appointed by the members in general meeting. Rather, that power can be reserved for a particular shareholder, a group of shareholders, a creditor, or any other person, as long as it's not contrary to the provisions of karma. But that notwithstanding, when we come to removal of directors, you discover that irrespective of how a person is appointed to the board, he can be removed by the members in general meeting. So they, they hold the ultimate scorecard. They hold the ultimate power of removal, irrespective of how you are appointed, irrespective of anything in the articles or in any contract. So the articles may provide that you will be a director for the next 30 years. The members in general meeting can decide to, to go against that. But of course, they'll be breaching contracts and liable for damages. Can we proceed, please? Yes. So a director can be appointed. OK, so who cannot be a director? Who may not be a director? A person under the age of 18, a lunatic, or a person of unsound mind, a person who has been disqualified under sections 279 for insolvency, a person who has been barred or disqualified for fraudulent uh, uh, involvement, and a person who has to vacate his office because he fails to meet his share qualification, or he resigns, or he resigns. So please look at section 284. So a person under 18 cannot be the director of a company for any reason whatsoever. He doesn't have that capacity, and so he cannot be brought in. Excuse Life me. directors. Yes, please. Now this lunatic. Yes. I think it's a lunatic that uh, the court. No, in this case, the court is not provided for. And the newcomer. Even in the old one. When, it, when we come to a formation of the company, the persons to join must have been found to be of unsound mind by a court in Nigeria or elsewhere. But when it comes to directors who may not be a director, the provision for the court is, is not in certain. Okay, so live director, a person can be appointed as a live director, but notwithstanding that appointment can still be removed by an ordinary resolution of the members in general meeting. Very, very important. Are there questions? I will take two. I will take two. No, no questions. Okay, so somebody who was a director. So, sorry, let me just, yeah, yeah quickly. You talked about uh, executive directors yes, please. and uh, non-executive directors. I think from my understanding, executive directors are those people who are staff of the company yes. and are given the responsibility to serve as directors also. Yes. Now, can somebody who is not and has never been a staff of the company appointed an executive director? Can he be appointed an executive director? Yes. Yes, anytime. Yeah, can, be, my can be brought from anywhere. Okay. Yes, any day it can be made an executive director. Yes, Sorry, take your own day. We just talked about live directors, and it is not part of the director's invention, so it is not part of the class. No, it's not among classification, not necessarily. 
a person, a person can be appointed as a director for life. So you could call him a life director. You know, so uh, it could be an executive, it could be a non-executive, but it can be removed by an ordinary resolution. Yes, Mr. Sufi. For life means until he dies. Yes, he can be appointed as a director for life. When you get to law school, one of the first things uh, you, 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 you ought to learn in company law is incorporation of companies. And they will, ask, they will teach you there that when you are incorporating a company for a client, the client may want, to, want you to advise him on how to protect his interests in the company. And one of the advice you should give him is to make him a life director since you are promoting the company. So just to point that out. Okay, so disqualification of directors, I've sent you my article, so please look at it, look at section 280, the Federal High Court can disqualify a person for 10 years or more who has been involved uh, in fraud, either as, a man, as, either as a director of the company or with respect to his act as a promoter. So if he has been convicted for fraud in the course of promoting in which case he wasn't a director, but he was promoting a company. Who is a promoter of a company? And the man behind the Zuna, uh, Oga, who is a promoter of a company? Yes, 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 sir. Who is a promoter of a company? A person who registers a company. A person who registers a company. You have an idea, but that is not the way we want to hear. That is not what we want to hear. Who is a promoter of a company? Yes. And Shemuel, that one close to you. That was here today. Yes. Who is a promoter of a company? Okay. Yeah, so a promoter is... Normally, the person who registers the company could be an agent, usually a lawyer. You tell him to incorporate a company, you pay him, you give him the details. But the promoter is somebody who, who takes, like you said, all the necessary steps to get the company registered. Are you with me? Or for a company that has already been registered. So a company can be registered, but it's almost dormant. So, or who with respect to an already registered company takes steps to get it going, to float it, to gather resources, to gather capital, to give life to it. So either way, that person is a promoter. So either he incorporates a new company or he injects life into an already established company, particularly with respect to gathering capital and resources to get it going. Are you with me? Such persons, because they are the midwives of, of the company, they have unusual powers to defraud the company. They could, for example, you, we talk about pre-incorporation contracts, they could enter into several pre-incorporation contracts that would be at their own advantage. On formation of the company, if it's a public company, they are required to hold a statutory meeting and table before all the members everything they've done to get that company going, they could decide not to disclose material facts. They could sell their assets to the company at a very inflated rate and, and pick the, the, the directors to uh, approve it. And that is why when we talk about approved ratification of pre-incorporation contracts, Kama said that the directors who are to ratify must be independent of the control of the promoter. But that is karma. In practice, it may not even be so. So in practice, all of them may be under his, inside the office pocket. And so what karma is saying here is that a person who has been convicted in respect to the promotion, formation, or management of a company could be disqualified by the Federal High Court for a period of not more than 10 years. Secondly, second, another time when this fraud can really arise is when the company is being wound up. So we could have fraudulent problems, fraudulent issues occurring all through, but we may not really see them until the company is now going down. Definitely when the company is going down, a liquidator will be appointed. This liquidator, on his appointment, the, the directors, they become what you call functus officials, so they take the back seat. 
and then he becomes the principal. He becomes the principal uh, officer of the company. If you may, he, he now answers directly to the court, and from time to time he is still required to call meetings of members, meetings of creditors, meetings of contributors, as the case may be. So, in the course of liquidating the company again, he could discover that there has been massive fraud, either from directors or from other persons who are meant to have managed the company. And so Karma provides that a person who in the course of the winding of the company is shown to have been guilty of an offense for which he is liable, whether he has been convicted or not under section 672 of this act, or has otherwise been guilty while an officer of the company of any fraud in relation to the company or any breach of his duty, again, may be disqualified by the by the court. So I, if you have looked at my articles, please look at it because I may ask you questions from them. Uh, and the one I I, I published uh, with the Commonwealth Law Bulletin, I argued that the director disqualification regime in Nigeria is is in fact I've I've, I've never known of, known of known of it to have been enforced. You know, as far as karma is concerned, you know, and the few director disqualifications I came across were done by SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and then the APC, Administrative and Proceedings Committee of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So this act, this particular section 280, is, a, is more, more like a dead section as far as Nigeria is concerned. But it's not like that in other countries. In the UK, for example, they have a, what they call the Companies House, which is just like our CAC. And whenever you go to the website of the Companies House, one of the things you see are directors who have been disqualified. So, so they disqualify directors regularly. Are you with me? Yeah. So if you have been found to have you know, been involved in some of these infractions, you are regularly disqualified. But they've gone beyond that to also now provide that if you have been disqualified as being a director, maybe in New Zealand or in the US or in one of these other countries, you can also be disqualified at home, which again is a good thing. I pointed out in my article that uh, a, a, a medical doctor that was bad, who has read the article? I know Sandra the Quiet will have read it. I've read it. Uh -huh. OK was, okay has also gone through it. You have read it? Yes, sir. OK, so. And I asked about uh, Cecilia Ibru. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, and the one, the one man too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You mm -hmm. also talked about it. So uh, I talked about a medical doctor who has been disqualified from practicing where? Which country? Which country? In Britain. Also. No, in Israel. In Israel, yes, yes. sir. Yes, and uh, he came to Nigeria mm -hmm. and uh, established a medical mm -hmm. practice and was functioning well, you know. But what the UK has done is that if you have been disqualified abroad. in abroad, then you, when you come here, you can also be disqualified. Particularly if they are the view that the country that disqualified you, they, they have a solid uh, legal regime. Beyond that, they've also added that a person who is a serial uh, who serially manages a company to the point of insolvency. So you have managed company A, it went down. You have managed company B, it went down. You have managed company C, it went down. You shouldn't be allowed to uh, <laughs> be a director of a company. So a serial uh, be a, be a mismanager of, 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 of companies can also be disqualified. Then lastly, of, of late, they've also added what you call competition disqualification, competition disqualification. So if you are found, again, to breach competition law in a country like the UK, you are found to be involved in what they call bid rigging and uh, market abuse, monopoly, and uh, all those offenses that are geared towards stifling competition. Are you with me so far? Yes. Then you can also be disqualified from directing any company. So I'll send you an article I wrote also on competition disqualification. I will, it has not been published, so I won't send it to you. What I will do is that I will print it and then I will give it to, maybe I'll give it to Bekowe too. And you guys can make photocopies. Excuse me. Yes, please. 
a, a director who resigns yes. for, for any reason, I think yes. he has a right to do that. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, I just found out that APAM and I, and ah, no, 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 I cannot work with APAM. Mm -hmm. For my own integrity, I decide to resign. And tomorrow it backfires. They say, no, I cannot be appointed. That is one. Two, Kamadi didn't also help us. Because they have said, of course, I, don't, I may not have any reason. No, a director who is resigned, who has resigned, cannot, yes. be, it's not, cannot be disqualified on that ground alone. Resignation okay. is not a ground for disqualifying the person. Do you understand? Okay. Yeah, no, this, this resignation, disqualification is a very serious uh, sanction. You can't just wake up and disqualify somebody from being a director. Even, in fact, the person who is of unsound mind, that is a temporary uh, incapacity, incapability. So once he becomes of sound mind, then he can be a director. The same with person who is under 18. Once he, he, he is able to re reach the age, he can join. The person who is insolvent, once he is no longer insolvent. So these are temporary incapacities. Okay. Yeah, but we're talking about a person who has been convicted for fraud. Particularly in relation to the management of the company. Yes, sir. That's, I'm coming there now. Okay. Because he said, in respect of running of a company, managing of a company. Mm -hmm. But here is somebody who is a, a, what I will now call Yahoo or Internet fraud stars. He makes money, or an arm robber who has now um, mm -hmm. repented, but he has gotten so much money. And then, he can now become a director of a company. Kama has not helped us in that way, sir. Okay. You are saying uh, a person who has been convicted in something else yes, other, sir. Than, other than management of yes. company. Yes, I should also be made. Definitely. Definitely. That is something that is worth looking into. Definitely. Let's move on. Okay, so rotation of directors. Please look it, look it up, section 285. Look it up. It, it applies by default, so it's not automatic. Uh, it applies by default. At, at the first AGM, everybody will retire. All the directors will retire. Subsequent AGMs, one third of the directors are to retire. And uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we determine one third? First in, first out. So please look it up 284. At the first AGM, by default, all the directors. Eh? 285. Yes, please. 285. Mm -hmm. If you are not sure of the section, check it up in Kama. So first AGM, every director retires. Second, every other subsequent AGM, one third of the directors retire, so that we can have room to inject fresh blood and then uh, all that. So, but again, it applies by default. It's not uh, automatic. It can be varied by the contract and the decision of the uh, member. So please look it up. So how do we know those ones who should go? That's what I'm saying. That. First in, first out. First in, first out. Okay. Yes. First in, first out. First in, mm. first out. Please look up 285. Then look at 287. You will come across it again in law school. And uh, how do we appoint directors for the private company? And uh, we can have one resolution to appoint all the directors for the public company. You must vote for director A vote for direct so you must have separate resolutions for each of the directors that you are to appoint very important look at it on 287 we have to keep rushing because of our time what is the time please is it up to one of the quarter five one we have to finish this in today yes we have to because on on wednesday we should enter into minority protection so that from next week we can now enter into new things most of what I'm saying here are already in my record. I'm only trying to update with the new camera, and we have much to cover. We don't have time. Can we continue? Yes. Sir. Yeah, so let's talk briefly about removal of directors because it's very important and very crucial. So please note those cases I have made reference to in my in my audio, and I will also send across to you the slide. Note Longy versus FBN. Longy versus FBN. That is the most important case you should note, and Yalaju, Yalaju Amai versus Arik, Yalaju Amai versus Arik, they are very important because they are Supreme Court authorities. They are very important because they are Supreme Court authorities. Longy versus FBN is of 
is, is recent, so it's 2012. 2012, and so it's a very important decision. I will also send you an article I wrote on it as well. So how do we remove a director? We have two major procedures. You could remove a director by contract, or you could remove a director by, by complying with the default procedure. The default procedure is contained in section 288 of CAMA, 288 of CAMA. And in essence, in essence, it gives the ultimate power of removal to the members in general meeting. And so 288.1 provides that the members in general meeting can remove any director, any director by an ordinary resolution, irrespective of anything contained in the article or in any other contract. So very important, irrespective of anything. So even if the articles provide that before you can remove this man as a director, you must give him 20 years notice. The members can hold a normal general meeting and remove him. So it is, it is, a, it is a power that the court, the court cannot give a specific injunction against. Are you with me? A power to, to direct, a power to uh, remove a director cannot, the, the power of the, com, of the company, of the members in general meeting cannot be you know, shackled by the courts, irrespective of anything that they have appended their signature to. Very important. The highest you can do is to sue the company for damages. And so what you are meant to do is to call a general meeting, call a general meeting, and then remove it. But before you call the general meeting, you would have, first of all, if, particularly if the director is going to, is being proposed to be removed, by a member, that member is required to have given to the company a special notice, a special notice. Sir, what is a special notice? The man on suit, the man behind the crew, yes. What is special notice to the company? Special notice is not That is passed to the member of the company. What would we mean by special notice, sir? By not technically. No, sir. You are not you are not attending all my classes, you are not listening to the audio. Favor my daughter. Favor my daughter. Help us. Quick, quick, quick. I've not sent that document to you, have I? I'll send it to the yes, please. Days to the company, 21 days to the members. Uncle, I hope you are hearing our daughter. Yes, sir. Can we continue? So, if I am proposing that this director should be removed because he's just messing up the company and all that, then I should give a special notice to the company. I also talk about two other instances where the special notice is mandatorily required. Can somebody give us any other one? When will a special notice be required? I talk about a person who is proposing uh, an overage director to be appointed for a public company. A special notice should have been required. There's another instance I give, so please go back and look it. So now you are proposing that the director should be removed, and then the secretary of the company is now calling a general meeting, EGM, AGM as the case may be, it will now spread to the rest of the members the proposal of shareholder A or B that this director be removed. Are you with me? When it does so, the director also may decide to respond even before the meeting. He may decide to respond by also sending his own, probably, defense and when he does, does that, if there is time, if there is time, the secretary must also spread it to the rest of the members. If there is no time, on the day of the meeting, the director must be given room to defend himself. Are you with me? And I said that the, his own defense will not be spread if it is done to generate needless publicity or it contains vexatious, libelous, defamatory matters, in which case the company can get the court to give it an order 
a directive not to spread its own defense, because it is actually not a defense, but it's rather uh, something totally irrelevant and all that. So look up, look up, yeah, look up the cases of, uh, like I said, Yaraju and look up Longe. Then also look up, look up Iwizu versus Iwishuku. Iwizu versus Iwishuku. Again, you will see that in my slide when I send it to you today. One thing I just want to point out here, the one key takeaway from the Iwizu case is the fact that an employee of a company, an employee of a company who has, who was employed, a person who is employed as a normal employee, let's assume you're employed as a legal, legal advisor of the company, and subsequently you were promoted to the board. And when you are, while you're on the board, you are now operating as legal advisor stroke director. So you have two, 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 two roles, legal advisor stroke director. Are you with me? By virtue of your elevation to the board, the company cannot just remove you as they would have removed any other normal employee. Again, you see that case, you see that when we come to secretaries as well, there's another Supreme Court case I'll give, give to you. What does it mean? In, in the case of Iwizu, this man set up a company and uh, he brought up a young, probably an apprentice, who was very industrious and hardworking, and they kept on promoting him and promoting him and promoting him, and eventually made him a director. Subsequently, there was a fallout among themselves, and he decided to sack him, because when he employed him, he employed him with a letter of employment that provided that I can sack you by giving you 30 days notice, as the case may be. So he decided to rely on that contract with which he employed the young man. And the court held that, no, by having elevated him to the board, his elevation to the board has superseded that contractual transaction that was entered into between them many years ago. And so he now has to comply with the provision in Section 288. It used to be 262. You have to comply with the provisions of the law by ensuring you give him notice, give him opportunity to defend himself, remove him at the general meeting. And if you fail to do that, that is the, that is the serious thing about that. If you fail to do that, everything you have done is just a waste. You know, so I used to ask the question that a director of a company has what you call a quasi, quasi, the employment as a director of a company has a quasi statutory flavor, discourse. It has a quasi statutory flavor, discourse. For those of you who have done a, a labor law, you would have come across the worst employment with statutory flavor, yes? Yes. Mr. Sufi, are you doing labor law? Yes, I am. Oh, great. So, an employment that has a statutory flavor is an employment that is protected by a statute. And so, you cannot just wake up and say you are sacking people. You can't just wake up, you know, and say you are sacking people. The head of a hospital management board that was established by law, the CEO or the CMB as the case may be, cannot just get angry with one man and say, write him a sack letter. You can't do that because the employment of that person is shielded by law. Are you with me? Yes. But when we come to an ordinary master-servant relationship, the idea is that you cannot impose a servant on what? Master. Eh? An unwilling master. That is the word, on, on an unwilling master. Because if you, are, if you are trying to do that, then you will be taking us back to the era of servitude and slavery. So you cannot impose a servant on an unwilling master. You cannot also impose a master on an unwilling servant. You know, and so if you wake up any day and you say you are not comfortable anymore with this person, you can sack him. And so you can sack him for any reason, for no reason, for bad reason. The highest he can get against you is damages. So he can sue you for unfair dismissal. Is it not so? Yes. I don't think in Nigeria we've yet got to the law of unfair dismissal, but in the UK we have that. You, so you could have unfair dismissal where a person is dismissed because the, the boss wanted to, and the boss was making sexual advances and the woman was not responding. And after that time, he changes his face. He begins to frown and frown and frown. I say, Madam, Madam, go and leave. Go and leave. And, you know, people do things anyhow here, but you can't do that abroad. You know, you can dismiss a person on the basis of his race, racial discrimination. That is unfair discrimination, unfair dismissal. 
You can dismiss a person on, on the basis of gender, race, even disability. Are you with me? A man was applying for a job in the UK. He applied to about 20 companies. In his capacity as a black man, they did not invite him. He now applied with the same qualifications. And when they asked, are you black, he said white. All the companies invited him for interview. I don't know if you understand. Mm -hmm. So he was being discriminated against, not on the basis of his qualifications, but on the basis of his, 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 his race. And so he brought an action. You know, so, but Nigeria, we've not yet got to that level. Where, and uh, though the National Industrial High Court, uh, is it in High Court? National Industrial Court has been somewhat proactive in, uh, in stretching the limits of the law and in protecting employees, but we still have need for statutory protection. We don't, we don't even have a strong, what you call, whistleblower protection regime. Have you talked about that in labor law? Yeah, so a whistleblower is an employee who, dis who decides to leak out information and all that. Again, in a lot of other jurisdictions, if you are a whistleblower and you are discriminated against, are you with me? Yeah, because a whistleblower is usually persecuted. So if you are discriminated against, you can bring an action against the company for being dismissed unfairly, as the case may be. But again, in Nigeria, we don't have, the, we don't have unfair dismissal, not to my knowledge. Sir. Now, I'm coming. Now, for the employee, now for the director of the company, for the director of the company, I'm saying that his employment has a quasi-statutory flavor. Why is it quasi? It's not absolute, because in a certain sense, he can be removed on the basis of contract. Are you with me so far? Are you with me so far? Are you with me so far? Yeah, so he can be removed on the basis of contract. So it is not wholly, it's not 100% statutorily secured. But in the absence of that contractual provision, then the only way you can move him is to comply with Section 288. And failure to do that will vitiate the whole proceeding. So you see that in the case of Longe, that after about uh, seven or eight years, he finally won. And two things. The one by one, the court ordered reinstatement. Again, for the director of the company, as well as the secretary, the secretary of a company, this is one instance where you see reinstatements, reinstatement being ordered by the courts, even though it's not working for a government entity. Because if you are, if you are working as a, as a medical doctor in a Bayelsa State um, a Hospital and Management Board, as the case may be, and you are wrongly terminated, and you bring an action against the entity, the court will not only vitiate everything that was done, the court will also order reinstatement. Is it not so? But if you are working for a personal employee, maybe you're working as a lawyer in a law firm, the only thing you can get is damages. You can't get reinstatement. If you are working for Shell and they sack you, you can't get reinstatement. You cannot. But when it comes to a director, you can get reinstatement. That's what we are saying. So in the case of Longe, even though he was sacked, and in, in the interesting thing, in his own case, he even did wrong. He took a loan that was not secured and cost the bank millions of billions. And so he was first of all suspended and told that during the time of your suspension, go and recoup our money. So we are suspending you, go and get our money back. And while he was on suspension, they held a meeting, I think that was 13th, 13th of June, 2002, and said, in fact, just, just go from here. <laughs> just go from here. And so he was now angry that the second meeting that they held, they did not notify him. And so he brought his action against uh, the company and the Supreme Court, Somehow they jumbled things up because they relied on uh, uh, and this provision, Section 288, and they also relied on Section 293. It used to be 266 and 260. You know, so they relied on these two sections to vitiate the whole proceedings, ask the company, the, the bank, to pay him all his emoluments, and ask the bank to reinstate him. Yes, let me hear you quickly, very quickly. Talk about time. Yes, sir. That's, that's, it's okay, sir, because you have already said so in first semester. Okay. That if uh, a director is mistakenly sat, you are yes. going to reach him. Yes, yes, yes. So that, that is that is it. particularly what happens is that particularly for executive directors, executive directors that have a lot of skill and capacity, in engaging them, you have to give them a long term of office, a long tenure. Are you with me? 
you have to give them a long tenure. So the notice period for their termination could be as high as five years. And that is why Kama now provides that any employment of a director where you have to give him a notice beyond five years, you will need the approval of the members in general meeting. So what happens in practice is that Dangote, for example, refinery, they are the DM, the deputy managing director, just resigned uh, one or two weeks ago. Now this guy is an Indian, and he has developed capacity over time in management of you know, this cement business. As far as cement is concerned, he knows his job. Now, if Dangote is going to bring such a person from India, you cannot bring him and tell him, uh, this is your, your transaction with us can be terminable at will or can be terminable on the giving of a three months notice. You can only say that to an hungry man. For such a person, you may say it can be terminable on three, three years notice. Are you with me? And so if you are no longer comfortable with him, you can say, my friend, in lieu of the three years notice, we are paying you three years salary in advance. Please go back to India. So the law allows you to pay him in lieu rather than for you to keep him there and he's jeopardizing things more and more for you. So in lieu of the three years and notice we ought to have given you, please take your three years salary and go. And so that's what it's alluding to. So you sack him and you make him a, a what? A millionaire. That's what Moreno said when they wanted to sack him the first time. Sack me and make me a millionaire. Because he was alluding to this fact that if Abrahamovich sacked him, you have to pay millions for doing nothing. Okay, so please look them up. Any question, I take one question, and then we move. In your bonga, are you with us? Good girl. Okay, quickly, quickly, please look up section 290, quorum of directors, quorum of directors, very similar to what we said about quorum of uh, members, uh, less than six, two, more than six, and uh, one over three, and all that. So please look up section 290, 291 as well. On notice of directors' meetings, I've already said you must give him notice. If you are going to, directors are not mandated. They are not mandated to meet. Though for public companies, for public companies, initially after incorporation, they must meet within six months. Other than that, directors are not mandated to meet. But we presume that they ought to meet if they are to operate as a board. Are you with me so far? Yeah, are you with me so far? But they are not mandated to meet. So they could take out, the board decisions could be taken out through what you call written resolutions. Everybody agrees, and that is okay. You know, but if they are to meet, then you must notify all the directors, and failing to do that vitiates the whole, uh, vitiates the whole proceeding. So, you want to see that in section 292, I said 293, it's not 293, 292, longer again, and uh, see also the case of Bumi versus Cadbury. Bumi versus Cadbury is very similar to Longe versus First Bank. Okay, so there are a number of things I want you to also note. Uh, financial matters relating to directors. Financial matters relating to directors. Again, because of the strategic role that they have in relation to the company, Directors are often in a place to untwist the company. So one of the key issues of corporate governance has been, has been directors' remuneration. Directors' remuneration. Directors being over-remunerated. Sometimes the emoluments and salaries of directors are increasing when the company is doing poorly. So the, the value of the company's shares you know, the value is going down, but the price of the, the what you are paying the directors is increasing. Is it right? No. It could be right. It could be right. Why? Ask me why. why? Because the directors may have taken, they may have taken certain decisions that may cause the value of the shares of the company to, 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 to nosedive in the short term, but in the long term, it will turn out well. So you cannot necessarily use the value of the shares in the stock market. Of course, that is a that is a criteria definitely to use to determine, to some extent, the emolument and remuneration of directors. But you cannot, on that basis alone, say that increasing the fees and the salaries of the directors is wrong because the value of the shares are going down. That's what we are trying to say. You could take a very hard and difficult decision 
that could bring a lot of suffering in the interim. I remember when uh, the former governor of River State, Ruth Miyamichi, and Ban Okada in Port Harcourt. Yes. I don't know if any of us was living in Port then. Initially, it was a, you were there. Yes. It was a very difficult decision, but he had to take that decision to you know, address criminality. And a lot of people complained, how will the poor people survive? But later on, people were, were praising him. Because I knew, at least personally, I knew people that, I know a young girl who was studying law, her leg was cut off. Mm -hmm. You know, cut off completely. At least I went to see her in the, in the because of Okada accident, and people were just injured in Portacot. You remember? Yeah. You go to hospital and you see seven, eight, nine people amputated, amputated. You know, so the same even in a company, a director could take a, a strategic decision that will bring positive results even when he's no longer a director 15 years from now. And so you cannot necessarily use that to determine, but that notwithstanding, corporate governance has sought, or one of the recommendations of several corporate governance schools is that the performance of directors should correlate to the performance of the company. The performance of directors should correlate to the performance of the company. And that we shouldn't, we shouldn't compensate directors for failing, for failure. Directors should not be rewarded for failure. Are you with me so far? So please look up section 293 to 295. 